good evening, cloud community, and welcome back to Salt Lake City, Utah. We are here coming to the conclusion of our three days of coverage at KubeCon North America. My name is Savannah Peterson, joined here by the fabulous and ineffable Rob Streche. Rob, we're just barreling through the day. Today has been great. I mean, the community, and I, you know, it's very fast and very interesting and wide ranging from you know, the highest level applications with AI. Now we're going way deep down, mm -hmm. which I love. And I get to where you know, the rubber meets the road or the software meets the data center, depending on how you look at it. Hey, so, I love cloud, it. You know. I love it, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> however you want to call it. Yes. Speaking of someone who's going to help guide us through this conversation, one of my favorite KubeCon guests to have on the show, Arun, welcome back. Thank you, I'm very happy to be here. Yeah, your smile always makes me smile. You're the perfect at the end of the day. Good vibes, good energy. You all have uh, made some announcements and done some interesting things since the last time you and I had the chance to catch up in Chicago. Yeah. Can you give us a little refresh of where we're at right now? That's right. So uh, back in April at part of the Open Source Summit, we announced this new project called as Opia, Open Platform for Enterprise AI. And this is, as we started looking at different Gen AI efforts happening inside Intel with our customers and partners, we realized lots of customers and developers are building this open source Gen AI stack, very bespoke, but very similar yeah. in a way. So what we did is we launched this project with the help of about 15 partners, and we gave this to Linux Foundation. And so this is a vendor neutral third party, you know, with LF, AI, and Data Foundation. And it's a project that sits over there. And uh, we're very excited about it. I, well, I can imagine, and I, I'm, I'm curious. So open source, it, very important to Intel, clearly. What, talk to me more broadly about your strategy, what being here means, how you're implementing open source technology within the company. Yeah, so I mean, open source has been very uh, essential part of uh, Intel, as you said. You know, I was looking at our history. First contribution goes back almost 40 years to GNU compiler. Wow. So it's a long history. Yeah, that's and over the last 20 years, we have only accelerated that much more. You know, we are uh, top, one of the top contributors to PyTorch, TensorFlow, Kubernetes, OpenJDK, and these are like massive projects. Yeah. And the reason we contribute to these projects is because our customers who are sitting in data center, hyperscalers, laptops, edge, network, they expect that these 300 plus open source projects we contribute to, they're optimized and leveraging the latest instruction. So we contribute straight up stream changes so that the customers have a very delightful experience. Yeah, and I, I think one of the challenges, and I, I think you touched on it, was again, there's so much open source. I mean, the, the open source AI day yesterday was packed and there's so many down in the project pavilion and all the way down there. I mean, it's great to see so many companies and projects starting up, but that also comes with complexity and things of that nature. So, Opia is really around helping determine an, like an opinionated stack. Is that how we should read that and how people should like That's right, that? opinionated to begin with, but fully customizable, yeah. right? So think about you know, batteries included, but replaceable. So that's the terminology that I like to use. So what like Opia that. is, you know, think of it as when you're building a Gen AI application, you need a whole bunch of microservices. Embeddings, retrievers, re-rankers, LLM, vector database. So the first combination of Opia is all of those about 30 plus microservices. These are all cloud native, so they're published as containers and you can run them anywhere. Now, the microservices by itself are not very helpful. What's really impactful for developers and the end customers is blueprints that sit by building those microservices together. So we have Gen AI examples, 20 plus of those, which you probably saw on the keynote this yeah. morning. So one of them is a rag chatbot. Now you want to build a rag chatbot, we are giving you a Docker Compose file or a Helm chart, so it would run on any compute instance, anywhere you have Xeon or whatever it runs, and then you can, with a single click, you can deploy your rag chatbot. Now, that opinionated stack, as you talked about, comes with Redis, TGI as a backend server, TEI as an embedding, and so on and so forth. But within Opia, what we have done is we have done integration with Instead of TGI, hey, you want to use VLLM? Sure, that integration is done. Instead of Redis, you want to use Quadrant, Chroma, Milvus, even Pinecone for that sake, which is not open source, but the idea is it's an open platform, 
So it's just an API contract that you got to honor. So we provide that diverse and wide set of inter integrations for you, which makes it very easy for customers to get started and bring those levers on. So some customers like, oh, I don't want to change the levers, I'm good with this, and some customers do want to get into the details and change the levers to customize, because their source of truth may be something else, not Redis necessarily. So that gives them that flexibility. So, so that would seem like, again, you're giving optionality still to the end user, but you're leading them to that so they don't have to be an expert in every step of the way because we, we've been talking and to a number of people today and it's like, hey, I'm an infrastructure person, not a data scientist. My data scientists want to work in Pi, you know, PyTorch or something like that, but I, I need to give them the right platform so that they were, you know, TensorFlow or what have you so they can build the algorithms and start to build out what they need to do. Right. And this is more than, even though you have the chatbot, it, it helps with more than just Gen AI, it's helping with AI in general. It would Correct, seem, like, yeah. So I mean, if you think about from the data scientist perspective, you know, they train these models, fine tune these models, but that's a training story. But once the model is trained, the model is available, all you do is you do that integration with Opia, because end of the day, you're not going to use the model as is, right? You're going to integrate the model as part of a blueprint, bigger blueprint. Model is just only one part of the solution. But when you're building the solution, what are the Lego pieces around it to build that beautiful castle that you want to build? And then- I oh, like where this is going. Yeah. I'm here for the castle. <laughs> right, yeah. how about that? And I don't <laughs> like my castle door to be red, I want it to be green. You can do that today. So that's what OPIA provides. How are you prioritizing? I can imagine, I mean, you work with the biggest companies in the world, and, and I can imagine a lot of people want a lot of different things. You mentioned that people were building similar stacks, but when it comes to the features that you're developing, how do you prioritize that, and what's the feedback loop like with the community? Yeah, so uh, OPIA is a vendor neutral third party project sitting with LF, so the governance model is very clear. There is a technical steering committee, uh, 11 seats on the technical steering committee, out of which only two are Intel because we were the wow. initial contributors. Cool. That was super important and very intentional to begin with. Love that. Because we want that TSC to be defining sort of the roadmap for OPIA. Even though Intel is putting the engineering efforts and other partners are putting into, but it's a very vendor neutral, you know, that method. So essentially the roadmap is created, then it's validated by TSC, they give a thumbs up, and then we go ahead and execute on it. Now, other exciting part is, when OPIA was launched, we had about 15 partners. Now we have about 45 plus partners. So we have seen that grow dramatically. One of the partners that we are particularly excited about is AMD. Now AMD is a partner, it's an Intel created project. So of course we do the validation and performance optimization on Xeon. With that, AMD gets all the free goodies, but now they're bringing their hardware as part of the CI CD validation part of it. So it's not just you know, AMD CPUs, but their MI300, which are their GPUs, that they're going to enable and validation on. So from a customer perspective, you know, it's what they're getting is a mix of everything that they want to see, because otherwise, you will have to do all of that validation, but now with Opia, you get that validation by itself. Yep. That's exciting. It's very exciting, actually. Do, do you see, and, and again, I, we've been seeing a trend where the, Rightfully so, people aren't building out their foundation models, most of them. I mean, some of the, the big guys are going to still do that and that's for their own reasons. But most people are looking at it, they're maybe training them, fine tuning it, then, you know, like you said, they're building out their rag and things of that nature, but then they're looking to do inference. And it would seem, again, people are looking for efficiencies at the edge in particular, and that's where CPUs are. I mean, not, I don't think people are going to be putting GPU, I mean, maybe they're putting GPUs everywhere, but cost-wise, people are looking at how do they use, are you seeing a lot of some of the work that's happening in there to really optimize inference at the edge and for those other use cases that are not these massive training models and things of that nature? Not just at the edge, actually, yeah. all across, even in data center, as a matter of fact. You know, because, it's always a trend, right? The pendulum swings too hard to the right sometimes. It's, oh, I need to write a hello world and I need a GPU for that. <laughs> let's think right, about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's think about that for a second. Why, do you really need it? Yeah. So what 100%. we are seeing from our customer base is, if you want to run a billion parameter model, a five billion or a seven billion parameter model, and you only want to do inferencing with a rag, that runs really well actually on a CPU. 
Yeah. And guess what? The most prevalent commodity across hyperscalers, data centers is Xeon. So in that sense, a lot of our customers are liking the direction that we are taking. That, yeah, bring on this OPI capabilities. We're going to do the inferencing on the CPU, whether it runs in data center, you know, whether it runs in a cloud, whether it runs on the edge. So all of that capability is there. So I think that's the beauty of it. That is a really, that, that is beautiful. We, we've had Ryan Tabra, who runs the Xeon team, on the show and always have really exciting conversations. I think there's something really is compelling there. And, and I, I'm really excited to see what starts to happen as we see AI adoption really hit scale across different verticals and a lot of different things happen. I want to take the conversation in a very different direction and I want to talk about your fabulous facial hair. <laughs> because you. <laughs> we, you always have the most striking Movember aesthetic of anyone. You, 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 you impressed me at last KubeCon. It is Movember. We do care obviously about men's health. The team is entirely men except for me, so I, I better care about <laughs> men's health. <laughs> but I, 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 I love how passionate you are and I know it's a very personal mission for you. So can you tell us why you're such an avid participant? Yeah, I think uh, the whole mission of Movember is no shave November, basically. And uh, I've been a public speaker for a very long time, for over a decade. I have leveraged this you know, stash to really make a statement about men's health. And oftentimes, you know, when you're a man, you think I'm more masculine, more macho. Hey, you know what? I don't want to be hung up on a poster in my family room. I want to play with my kids on the family wall floor. Mm, I, yeah. I want to play on the floor. So essentially this is a statement about men's health, mental, social, and physical. And uh, our Surgeon General, Vivek Krishnamurti, has declared men's health as a pandemic. Mm -hmm. And he talks about how men should not worry alone. As a man, we have a tendency, no, I'm going to figure it out. Hey, you know what? If this is something bothering you, this is probably bothering very many other men in your family as well. Or talk to your partner or talk to your brother, or talk to your father, or talk to your son, whoever, or any other female, or any other person that you trust, yeah. don't worry alone. So that's one part of it. The second part of it is, we were talking about self-care. Make sure you take care of yourself, you know, because KubeCon are hectic schedules, mm -hmm. but I took out time this morning, 50 minutes, for an intense workout. And that's what allows me to sustain, because I've had me time, and I'm physically ready to manage it. And then the social element of it right here itself, you know, you see so many people. To me, hugs are very therapeutic. So when just having a hug, you know, just rubbing a little bit back on the back, it kind of goes a long way. You know, and again, it's everybody's comfort level, so I seek that permission first. But then, to me, that's very, so I think those are simple things that I care about it. And everybody in their life has a man, right? A father or a brother or a partner or a friend or a colleague. Let's make men more healthy as well. I, I love that, and, and so wonderfully stated. I'm, I'm happy I'm a part of your therapy plan. You came up and gave me a big hug right away, and it made me very happy as well. I'm, I'm on the same team. I'm curious, because I think this is a really important conversation that we don't talk about enough, particularly at the enterprise tech level. Self-care isn't always the hottest topic in our interviews. How do you promote a culture of compassion and empathy and self-care like you just described within your own team? I think it's a, to be a role model. You know, uh, my charter in the team is a lot bigger. I run the developer program for all of Intel. And basically saying that, hey, you know what? I can't take a meeting from 6.30 to 7.30 in the morning because that's my running time. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to do that. And I'm not going to change it. Um, declining meeting so that your team feels empowered to do that too and respecting that. Mm -hmm. I am going to take a 45 minute lunch break and I'm not going to be on a call because I need to fix up a salad and I need to go for a walk around the block. I am going to wrap up by 6 p.m. and I'm not going to take a light night call because I need to do the dinner. Because if I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to feel happy. So I think creating those boundaries for yourself goes a long way and guiding your team that it's okay to do that for yourself, I think that's the way to go for it. And yeah. really, self-care is what this boils down to. Yeah, Those like boundaries, said, yeah. yeah. And leading by example, I, I yeah. think that's a big oh piece of it. And I, I've done similar stuff for my teams as well because I, and in some ways I've also said don't be me it's sometimes because our travel gets to be so extreme and stuff like that. But yeah. again, it's, it's really an interesting and I, I appreciate you doing that Thank as you, well. well I mean you were talking about, yeah. you know, in a face they say, in a, in a plane they say, put your mask on first before you put others. Think about this way. 
the advice that you give to your friends and family to live a healthy life, do we follow that same advice for ourselves? Yeah, exactly. It can be very tricky. So talk to yourself as your best friend and live that healthy lifestyle. Yeah. I, I, I love that. You know, one of the things that I do uh, for most events, I actually didn't for this event for a variety of reasons, but I always do my nails based on the color of the yeah. event. And, yeah. and I make sure that I go get my nails done during business hours, because that is not only self-care, it's also a part of my job and a part of my uniform. And I very much normalize it with the guys. I'll ask the customers and I'm on my way to the nail salon and I'm like, yeah, it's this is a part of the deal. Right. I shouldn't be having to take my personal Savannah time to do something that is a part of the aesthetic that people comment on the whole time. So I, I just, really respect that. No, I think yeah. that's super important and calling it out. Yeah. yeah. Calling it out. Yep. Yeah. That is, that is the norm. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I think, I, I, yeah, it's just, it, I, I always love chatting with you, but I think if folks took nothing else, I, I'm, well, obviously they should go check out Opia, <laughs> but if they took nothing else from this, though, there is a little AI thing that, going on. But. <laughs> there is, there is, but frankly, that AI thing doesn't matter unless uh, we're all feeling great about it and living our best healthy lives, and we all alive, want yes. AI to, to make us healthier humans. Yep. All right, Arun, last question for you. Because we could just go on and I can tell I'm at the stage of the day where I just want to take the train with you on the self-care path. When we have you back on the show, which we obviously will since we're here back together again, what do you hope to be able to say a year from now in Atlanta, for example, or in London that you can't yet say today? So my hope for Opia project is I want to have this Opia solutions available in all five hyperscalers in their marketplace. Because right now, the solutions are validated on the hyperscalers, but it's a bit of a manual step. Mm -hmm. I want a single click deployment. You know, I want to be able to see a wide set of integration, which are well documented, a great customer adoption. You know, single click, I want to deploy on AWS, on Azure, on GCP, on Oracle. Pick a favorite cloud provider of your choice, and it's available. I think that would be a good measure, because end of the day is building that mind share and making it simple and easy for developers and customers to deploy these applications. Because if you do the education well, selling will happen. Love that, and we look forward to hearing about all of those single click deployments when we have you on the show next time. Arun, thanks Absolutely. for being the best. Yeah. And, and fantastic stash. Yeah, are you going to participate in November one of these times? I haven't shaved this in a while. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, it's true. I, well, I guess actually, this is longer than normal. You're kind of like in a so perpetual we'll, November. This, yeah. always, we'll see, how, we'll we'll see if I can get to December without touching this stuff, that, that stuff. We'll see. We'll see. They, they, Anderson may have problems with my uh, stash and the, the, the microphone at some point in time, but we'll see. It's <laughs> calibrated for yes, that. Yes, he's, he's, he's good with that. He can, they're shaving. professionals, they're he's the best. He's going to start shaving so. a little bit of a line right here, <laughs> just, Funny. just for the <laughs> mic line. You should do that as a joke at some point. Uh, anyway, no. thank you for joining me, Rob Arun. Fabulous. And thank all thank of you, you so for much. tuning in, wherever you might be. We're here in Salt Lake City, Utah, coming to the end of day one of KubeCon North America of our three days of coverage. My name's Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for enterprise tech news.